So I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, the research that I'm working on, which is called Primordial. And it's really about um, focusing on the nature of things and what happens when things wake up. Um, a few years ago, I put out a book called Trillions. I was one of the co-authors of the book, and it was really about what happens when we live in a sort of infinite sea of computing, when we basically have trillions of things sending billions of messages. It was sort of a field guide to the next era of the information age. Um, and when I said a sea of information devices, um, it made me think that you know, it wasn't just about the Internet of Things. Uh, it turns out it's maybe more like a soup. It's more like a primordial soup of crazy amounts of complexity all around us. You know, the era of disconnected products and services and environments is over. And I think we all have to come to terms with that. It's not just the Internet of Things. It's also digital manufacturing and machine learning. So these are three trends that are on a collision course, and they're sort of inevitable. They're happening whether we like them or not. And my question maybe is really, how do we put people first? So how do we shape a world of networked matter? You know, when things wake up, when, when we have all those things coming together and we're in this soupy sea of computing, how are we going to design ecologies? Because that's what it really is. It's an ecology of things and a community of things. How are we going to design those? We know a few things about ecologies when we're talking at that scale. And they're also the same things we know about economies. Economies and ecologies live on the edge of chaos. They also allow for the freedom for agents to act on and exploit underused resources, which means our things might be having some sort of a distributed currency so that they could actually participate in this economy or this ecology. We also need, know that they need liquidity to grow and flow. That's the way ecologies work. Are we designing for that right now, or are we designing the Internet of Thing? I think that's one of the questions that we have to answer. So I'd like to introduce you to Project Primordial. That's my research project that I'm working on, and I'll talk a little bit about what sort of spark it'll take to maybe wake things up. So let's dive into the soup. First, we'll start with something you know, or at least you think you know. Um, GE has identified hundreds of billions of dollars of value over the next decade, really just harnessing 1% of the potential for the industrial internet, what they call the Internet of Things. Why do you think Google actually bought Nest? I think it's a worthwhile question to ask. My answer would be they saw a chance to install an oil well between the living room and the kitchen. And they were going to drill for oil for 15 years. They're going to get all the information from your family, but they're also going to get from the house, and they're going to get for the next two families that come through that place. That piece of property has amazing exhaust data coming off of it. Or consider body media. So these guys used six sensors and some algorithms to replace mass, and they generated over 500 trillion data points from a few hundred thousand people. They called it body media because it was about the exhaust media pouring off your body. And what if they could harness that media and start to discover the, the instruction manual for the human body? And the flow of devices doesn't end outside of us or even with what we wear. Um, soon it's going to be inside of us. These are eye drugs. They use magnesium and copper to actually turn your stomach acid into a battery so that they can send a wireless signal to that Band-Aid. These are already in trials in the UK. This isn't science fiction. And the last few speakers have told you that there's way more to come. But it's not just the Internet of Things. It's not just trillions of things. There are some other ingredients. So think about digital manufacturing. The way we make things is changing. The future of making things itself. So at this point in time, we can use free programs like 1-2-3-D-Catch to rip atoms into bits. That's a big deal. Do you remember when that happened with the music industry, when we had these things called CD rippers and, and, and suddenly it changed the entire business model? It didn't stop people from listening to music. It changed the model. We can also print large 3D structures. So we can build buildings. We can build bridges. We can build massive infrastructure using robots and using new kinds of 3D printing. Think about the work we're doing with George Larman. We're actually looking at building bridges that are natively built into the environment and self-assembling. We can also print organs. Over at Pier 9, we've got uh, photopolymers we're engineering that can actually be made out of collagen. We can print millions of DNA strands a day, like the work we're doing at Pier 9 with our synthetic biology group. And you just heard some amazing stuff coming out of MIT. And humankind can now manufacture off-planet for the first time in human history. So instead of engineering something to last the first few minutes of shaking and crazy pressure, send an email to print a wrench in outer space. This was made in space, and they sent an email. 
uh, to save the $20,000 a pound shipping charges. Last year, Invisalign manufactured 3 million retainers. They were all digitally printed. So the dentist slid some sliders to say how much they want the teeth to hurt and how tightly they want it to move. And the patient set a slider that said, this is how many teeth I have. And the brand, Invisalign, said, these are the constants. This is what makes Invisalign Invisalign. So I would posit that Invisalign did not design a product or a SKU. They designed a species. And then they allowed the individuals to evolve in the wild. This was co-creation writ large. They, they basically changed the nature of things. Supply chains are also being reinvented. We've heard a lot about this in terms of manufacturing. Think of something just fun like the Barbie doll. It's a $2 billion industry, about two or 300 grams of polymer in each Barbie doll. That means you can fit the way that they're built today, about 13,000 of those in a shipping container. If anyone's tried shipping stuff around the world, it turns out the Gulf of Mexico is tough to get anything through. Maersk is over capacity. But if I just ship the polymer, I could do the equivalent of 250,000 Barbie dolls. That kind of economics is going to change things. Um, here's our uh, enterprise manufacturing tool for four-year-olds. It's something on Tinkerplay, it's called Tinkerplay. It's on iPad for free. And it's parametric modeling. It's built on architecture. You can go and touch and, and tap and actually change things dynamically. You can add textures. You can add colors. You can make a product. And then you can ultimately peel back the curtain and see how that product lives in the world. And then you can go out and say, how would it be designed for manufacturability and build it out? So we like sometimes to look at the next generation because they're ready for the future. So if you're, you have a four-year-old, there's a great enterprise manufacturing tool out there now. We also have something called 123D Circuit. We have about 250,000 users on this one. Um, and it basically lets you go from breadboarding and schematics to, to built for manufacturability circuit boards fully populated that arrive on your door. Our project Wire takes it just a little bit further. This one actually, while it's 3D printing, stops occasionally and says, put in a battery put in an LED, put in a circuit board, maybe add a motor. And when it's all done, these two trends are now coming together. And you scrape it off the plate, and you grab your remote control, and you take off your drone. So this is the Internet of Things slamming into digital manufacturing. And it's just the beginning. So the last one, the sort of last ingredient in the primordial soup is machine learning. And I'm sure we've heard a lot about this. It's suddenly that we have enough computing power to do it. At Autodesk, we're working on something that's called Dreamcatcher. And it basically uses infinite computing to go through millions of possibilities to help a designer have superpowers. Um, what's kind of interesting here is it grows children, millions of them, using infinite computing with all the possible variations on how you're trying to set up things. And then you cull it through sort of a Socratic method. It's called goal-directed design to actually generate a million more. So you can find islands of stability and brand new places of value. Here's an example of a chair that went from 10 grams to, or 10 kilograms to 3 kilograms using Dreamcatcher. And it's not only using machine learning for design, the products themselves are starting to have opinions. OK, so Google self-driving car, this is Mercedes. They don't even want you to face the road. You should just have a cocktail party. Um, they have mirror neurons. How many people have heard of mirror neurons? OK, so neuroscientists believe that we have these kind of weird things where, like, I have these neurons that shoot because I'm trying to figure out how to model my behavior with you. I'm trying to figure out how to collaborate with you. These neurons kind of mirror your behavior so I can learn and figure out where I end and you begin. And this car has to figure out if that kid's going to run in front of it. The car has to collaborate and decide whether to hit the school bus full of children or take me off a cliff. And anything, according to Moore's Law, that's in you know, maybe cars today is in your shoes tomorrow. Let's not forget that. So this is a neural processing unit that uses carrots, good robot, and sticks to basically teach it. No writing code at all. This is an NPU processor from Qualcomm. All the processing is done is on chip directly. Great. So today, I'm going to do a little demo. Today is sort of about these static equilibriums. Think of it as like a pendulum. You know, we set up a factory, we set up a supply chain, life is good. We don't change anything because it's hard to change a supply chain. Um, but if something changes, we're in trouble. Tomorrow, I would say it's going to be a lot more like life. Once we get that spark, it's going to be like this. We're suddenly going to be able to trade off dynamic equilibrium, which gives us agility and future proofing, and static equilibrium, the same way a dove's wings are static and conserve power and then flaps away when we suddenly have a hawk attacking us. 
This is the primordial soup we're talking about. And if you look deeply at it, you notice that it gives us learning, it gives us motivation to be able to move things, and it gives us sensing and response. That's the Internet of Things, machine learning, and digital manufacturing. We suddenly, for the first time in human history, have all these things. And we're going to have to design for ecologies of things and design for a loss of control and learn how to co-create because the very nature of things is going to change. And I'm going to leave you with this one thought. It's going to change a lot of industries. This morning we saw Kevin talking about rebooting the entire automotive industry. Think of hot rodders, right? Back then they made the things they loved so they could drive the things they loved. But now if you want to make any impact at scale, you actually have to be a billionaire to actually get the, the, the sort of attention of the big three automakers. This is a sea of unsold cars and broken dreams. So we're going to announce today the, the launch of a little experiment. It's my research experiment called Primordial Motors. What if three kids in a dorm room could start a car company? We're starting to see that that might actually be possible. What if we could use things like Design Graph that uses machine learning to explore all the nouns and verbs and geometric structures of everything everybody's ever built in any Autodesk product to actually give the power of 10,000 engineers to three kids? I mean, think about it. What if we could actually embed authoring tools right into the garage? What if we could actually have products that actually shape other products the same way I shape the world and the world shapes me? And what if we could design for disassembly and assembly and, and use throughout the entire life cycle? What if a factory wasn't a place anymore, but it was actually a social network? So that's the kind of stuff we'll be exploring down in the booth. We've airdropped a little sneak peek from the future, and we're starting this research journey as sort of an open innovation effort. By the end of the year, we're hoping to launch a national challenge around hack rods and what happens when we can really get a, a whole community engaged, people like Kevin, to be able to think about new things and really turn it into more than just a spectator sport. And I'll leave you with this. If you go to our booth, you're going to also find out that the future's already here in our Fusion 360 product. We've got a whole bunch of stuff going on there. And, um, it's just unevenly distributed a little bit. So come and visit us and find out a little bit more. Thank you.